Yes, good evening. Last week it was the established superpower that demanded our attention and kept us up all night long with an election thriller that Hollywood would be proud of. But tonight we will again look to that part of the world where things are really happening. We again look east to the new superpower. Welcome everyone this evening at the third episode in the series The Many Faces of Modern China, a series organized by the Bali and the Leiden Asia Center. Tonight, we will be talking about China's presence in the world, what shapes the current relationship of China with its neighbors, with other major powers, and with the global south. And of course, we'll take stock of the recent developments in Washington. What will a Biden presidency mean for Asia, for China, and for the world at large? My name is Michel Keres. I'm diplomatic editor at NSA, and I have the privilege to be your host this evening. Now, regrettably, I am here in the Bali, and you are there at home, behind your screen. Of course, it would have been much nicer if you uh, could have been here and we could have been all together. But um, nevertheless, I do hope you will participate this evening in the discussion. There is ample room for questions following uh, the debate here in the Bali. You can easily send your questions uh, via the Slido app, and the code will appear in your screen momentarily. Uh, of course, we'll do our utmost to answer your questions. We'll try to squeeze in as many as we can. Uh, and there's, oh, there's one chance, there's an easy way to improve the chances uh, that you will find your question is keep it short and simple. Okay, we will have this organized as follows. We'll do two table discussions, two rounds of discussions. We'll start uh, in the immediate vicinity of China, and then gradually walk through the world, so to speak. So we start in Asia, then look at the Middle East, we look at Africa, and finally we'll end in the West, we look at Europe, and especially, of course, the Netherlands. So that's quite a trip for an evening. Uh, all my guests have ample academic credentials, but also they all promise to be pointed, pointed sorry, and fearless in their comments. So let's please get started. Uh, at the table already is, to my side, welcome Kathleen Ferrier, chair of the Dutch UNESCO Commission. She has lived and worked for, I think, five years, five in, years. in Hong Kong. She is uh, a matured voice in the debate on China in the Netherlands. And uh, most of you will know her because she was a former MP of the Dutch party CDA. Uh, at the table as well is uh, Michael Kano Heymans. She is senior research fellow at Klingendaal, a visiting lecturer at the University of Leiden. Um, her main research interests are connectivity, uh, economic diplomacy, and international relations, and at all in an EU Asia context with special interest for China and Japan. Mm. Um, to say short, she knows a lot about a lot. Let's keep it that way. Okay, but let's start with the excitement of the, of the weekend. Uh, yeah. Kathleen, where were you Saturday evening when you heard and what was your first reaction? I was glued to the television. And like you were saying, this was uh, a, a big movie would have been jealous of the impact the images had. And uh, of course we were all watching, uh, sleeping a few hours, waking up, asking, do we know it already? And then finally the word was out, Biden has won, together with Kamala Harris, of mm -hmm. course. Um, he's the president-elect. And um, well, that, that, that was a very special moment for many reasons. In the first place, what we see is a deeply divided United States that was left behind by Trump. What we see on the worldwide level is that for years, Donald Trump has changed the political debate, the political ethics mm -hmm. all over the world. We see when we look at China that the Trump administration has had a huge impact on the position China could take in the international level. Uh, backing away from the, mm -hmm. climate, uh, um, the climate deal, etc giving China all the opportunity it wanted to show itself as a confident partner in the international community. So it was quite exciting to see um, 
tr that Trump has lost the election, but uh, many challenges also regarding the relation to this uh, uh, world power, whether you like it or not, that China is. And if you ask me what I was doing, what really moved me deeply was the image of Fenn Jones, mm -hmm. a political commentator, I think, of CNN, yes. who was started to, uh, uh, to talk with power and then broke into tears, basically saying how relieved he is that after four years of racism, sexism, as a black man feeling that you are not part of America, feeling discriminated, put aside, that that time was over. Now, whatever happened, that time was over. So on the national level, the fact that Biden now is the president-elect and we still have to see what will happen over the next mm -hmm. few weeks, I'm absolutely not certain of what will happen there. Uh, on the national level, you see, uh, uh, well, um, the relief on one side that Trump is gone, but a divided country. And on the international level, with all the geopolitical changes we have had, a whole new game to play. Okay, we'll get to that game in a second. Michael, where were you Saturday evening when you heard the news? And what was your first feeling? Well, all that Kathleen was just saying, yes, I, I share that feeling. Um, Shame of relief, basically. Relief, in a way, yes. But also um, still a big question mark of where is this world going? Because uh, Trumpism, as people have started calling it, yes. is here to stay. Mm -hmm. and, and how are we going to deal with this? First of all, how is America going to deal with that? And as an extension of that, what can we expect of America and the world? Um, of course, everybody in the EU has been you know, very happy, yes. uh, congratulating already Mr. Biden. Um, but uh, in Asia, um, the, the responses have been yes. more divided. Okay. Um, what, what do you think they, they reacted, the reaction was in Beijing, in the upper echelons? I mean, we have seen last week that on, uh, on Chinese uh, social media, there was a lot yeah. of schadenfreude about the mess they were making in this wonderful democracy in the United States. It was a, a fairly yeah. disastrous uh, yeah. process. It still is to some degree, but the, mm -hmm. the two presidents, the one not willing to leave yet. Um, but what do you think on the more, on a, if, looking from a policy perspective in Beijing, what, what was their reaction? Were they I think it's, it's mixed, probably. For, for China, I think uh, the United States under President Trump has been a great opportunity, yeah. right? They filled in all the gaps that he left behind in multilateralism, mm -hmm. um, or at least they did so rhetorically, yes. um, not always um, in real action, mm -hmm. as in the climate field. Um, but uh, in the United Nations, for example, we've seen a huge staffing of the United uh, of Chinese uh, people, where the United States left um, the Human Rights Council, but also many other organs of the United Nations. Just as one example, so in that sense, for them to well to see that opportunity sort of dwindling, um, because the United States is, of course, expected to return to multilateralism, not in the way that we were used to it, uh, to having it. Uh, we will be still, I think, more America first uh, mm -hmm. compared to what it was before Trump. Yes, okay. um, and there will be also very harsh on China still. You know, that anti-China sentiment in the United States is bipartisan. Everybody yes. uh, in the United States I speak to, uh, they, they, well, that's what they say. Um, so we're, that we're here to deal with that still. Um, but in, in China, of course, less, a more predictable China, our United States is also helpful. Yes. Um, and so I think Trump, that Biden will offer that. Mm -hmm. And I think that, uh, that Xi Jinping, as well as Putin perhaps, was sitting quietly in his chair when we were glued to CNN, thinking what his population would say. So this is democracy. So this is what democracy leads to. A divided country, anger, aggression, a president who doesn't want to leave, a terrible mess. So, you know, for people like Xi Jinping and Putin, this is very helpful. So this is democracy. Is that what you want? Is it not better to have a government system like ours, uh, authoritarian system with capitalist um, aspects yes. that give, uh, results in a good living? So what do you want democracy for? 
Okay, so it was a, a public relations disaster for democracy as, as far as that's concerned. Um, staying with democracy, let's, yeah. um, the idea is to, to, to move around in, in the vicinity of, of China. And one of the first things that's come to mind is the situation in Hong Kong. Hong Kong. Um, bring us back up to speed, because we've paid a lot of attention to Hong Kong in the past years, uh, yeah. but may, <laughs> mainly due to the American elections, it kind of disappeared yeah. out of uh, immediate view. Um, you worked there for five years. You yes. taught Spanish there at the university, Gender I guess. and politics, and politics. European politics, okay. yes. And um, uh, now bring us to you. What's the situation at the moment there? Yeah, so um, I lived in Hong Kong for five years. And like you're rightly saying, now all the attention is focused on what is happening in the United States. In general, here in Europe, but also here in the Netherlands, we have the tendency to always look at the West, to look at what's happening in the United States. And what I was trying to make clear during the five years that I was working and living in Hong Kong is how important it is to move your vision away from the West and turn a bit to the East and see what is happening there. Mm -hmm. Because um, very uh, silently, um, China is taking the world stage, its righteous place, according to the Chinese philosophy. And that will have huge impact, is, is already having a huge impact in Europe, in European democracy. So for democratic countries, it's very important to watch closely what's happening in Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. And what I have seen in those five years is how the influence of China in the city of Hong Kong became silently, um, smoothly, but every day growing. It was really very impressive. When, when I arrived in Hong Kong in 2013, uh, one uh, year later there were the elections for the CEO of the city, you might say the mayor mm -hmm. of Hong Kong, and like it was uh, organized, back in 1997 when Hong Kong, the city, was given back by the British to China. It was promised in the Sino-British Declaration that Hong Kong could have its democratic rights. Yeah? Um, so there was a new system, a new principle, one country, mm -hmm. China, with two systems, an authoritarian system and a democratic system. And part of the democratic system is that people could go out to vote. So when, there was, when the moment came to vote, China said, OK, Hong Kong, you can vote. All people who have a right to vote can vote. But we in China determine who the candidates are. Mm -hmm. And that caused a lot of movement from the students, the, the, the umbrella movement. They occupied the streets. And from that time on, democracy has uh, gone under, uh, um, has been curtailed mm -hmm. more and more. Freedom of speech, journalists who have been sent out of the country, uh, political freedom, political parties who have been um, denied access to the LegCo. Bit by bit, um, also the system that every day in Hong Kong, 150 people from the mainland can um, come to Hong Kong and make a living there. And that already, when I was in Hong Kong, resulted in the fact that my students said to me, we have no chances here. Jobs and houses are for mainland people, not for us. And then last year, as you might very well remember, Michael, uh, we had these huge protests. Mm -hmm. That was when, because of the security law. Yeah, when you have to millions that a bit, of people. How that works. Yes, yeah. millions of people went out to the streets when the when the mayor of Hong Kong, Mrs. Carrie Lam, proposed uh, uh, an extradition bill that would make it possible for Hong Kong people to be extradited to other countries, including China, and that would immediately have an an effect on the democracy of Hong Kong uh, because there would no longer be a guarantee for transparent uh, jurisdiction, uh, juridical uh, processes, because people could be sent to China. And that had an effect 
on the attractiveness of the city for international businesses, for international fi financial organizations. As you know, Hong Kong is like the key point, the turning mm -hmm. point between West and East. So many international businesses are based in Hong Kong, but accepting this bill would mean that Hong Kong would become less interesting a place for businesses to, um, to settle down. So people got very angry, went out on the streets, and uh, it was really impressive to see that in a well-organized um, city like Hong Kong, with law-obedient people like uh, the Hong Kong people are, to see all this turmoil, to see all this violence. And, um, well, there's a lot to say about it, but basically everybody asked, and asked me also, how will China react? Mm -hmm. How can mainland China accept this turmoil in Hong Kong under the principle one country, two systems? What will happen here? Will we see another Tiananmen Square, the events in 1989? We hope that this will not, uh, it will not happen again. So um, everybody was watching what's going on. China cannot accept it. Will the tanks roll down the streets in Hong Kong? I never expected that to happen. And the answer of China came a few months ago with a new security law that was put into place on the symbolic day of July 1st, mm -hmm. um, the day Hong Kong was given back by the British to China in 1997 and uh, uh, the National Day of China. So on that day, the security law uh, came into ruling, and that security law is like a coup. Mm -hmm. Freedoms are cur curtailed. People um, uh, don't, want, don't dare to speak themselves out. Yeah. Even today, um, the rumor was that for uh, LegCo people, uh, parliamentarians, and in the Legislative mm -hmm. Council, the, the, the people's representation we have in Hong Kong, that four people would lose their seats because years ago they did not say the proper words when they were sworn into the LegCo. And so the whole group of democratic um, uh, LegCo members said, we will all move out together. So you see that day by day, uh, the democratic rights are, are, are Curtails, cut down curtailed, yes. more and more. Do you think that uh, the, it's, it's, it's getting more difficult to protest and to, yes. to fight China from Hong Kong? Yeah. Uh, do you think that uh, there was, was some uh, new hope brought by the election of Biden? Do they think that Probably. a new United States might help them? Yes. And um, is it, or is it too late for that? Um, Many people, everybody who has a chance leaves Hong Kong mm -hmm. now. Hey? Many people who are leaving Hong Kong, many are going to the UK, of course, but also to the USA and to Malaysia, uh, Thailand, mm -hmm. etc. Taiwan, I believe that most people are going. Yeah. To Taiwan, also a lot of people are going and they want to continue their, their uh, fight for Hong Kong. The revolution of our times, as it is called, they want to um, to, to continue it from those places. And certainly, this means an, a new window of opportunity to see if with a democratic administration mm -hmm. in the United States, there will be more opportunities for support from the United States. As you know, um, um, for the United States, Hong Kong now is a part of China. And they said it's no longer a democracy, mm -hmm. so we... That was the... That was the, the, yeah, that was the, the Trump, Trump administration, administration. Have, yes. Yes. Okay. yes. And uh, so we will, see, we will see what happens. But um, that is why I say uh, democratic countries, countries based on liberal democratic principles, should watch closely what is happening in Hong Kong. This month, a year ago, there were elections um, uh, for uh, uh, county elections. Mm -hmm. And it was a huge victory for the pro-democratic camp. And that also has resulted in this security law. 
has resulted in the fact that in September there would have been elections. They were postponed for right. one year at least. So this is the way China operates. Okay. Not like Russia, not killing uh, uh, journalists, but, but very quietly more patience. growing its influence. Okay, Let's, you already mentioned uh, Taiwan. Um, it's uh, uh, in the five-year program China uh, uh, announced in two or three weeks ago, end of October, it was said that uh, Taiwan will be uh, part of the mother country, uh, more than it was behind. And since we have this kind of a power vacuum in, in Washington these days, uh, some have argued that it would be a great yeah. opportunity for China to somehow change uh, the position of Taiwan. Um, does that worry you? Um, I'm not so sure. I think Taiwan has been rather confident of its relationship that it has been able to develop with the Trump mm -hmm. administration over recent years. Uh, so one of the countries where people actually have been uh, perhaps hoping more than in other places that Trump would stay is Taiwan. Yeah. Um, so in that sense, I think they're worried about what the Biden administration is going to do. Um, but yeah, whether we have a vacuum in between and China will take opportunity of that, I, I don't honestly, I, I, I don't know. Um, we know, of course, um, that Ch China's ambitions of sort of returning uh, Taiwan to the yes. motherland, yeah. um, they've been longstanding. This was a confirmation of yes. policies that yeah. we've seen already. Um, and uh, the Chinese have been acting on this, mm -hmm. um, of course, in recent years. It's, it's gotten, you know, yeah, more and more. Uh, I was recently speaking to people in Taiwan. They said now also the, the Chinese are entering their uh, um, air defense identification zone with fighter jets. Okay. Um, that was before the Trump election, or b b before the <laughs> election uh, where Trump was uh, ho probably Hopefully going leaving. to be ousted. Yeah, yeah. Biden um, won. Okay, let's, let's keep that. <laughs> yes. Um, but so they have been dealing with this, this increased pressure yes. um, and, and responding to it. Um, I think it's indeed uh, the Biden is very aware of this mm -hmm. um, and he may not be supporting uh, Taiwan in as outspokenly as you know Trump has been outspoken in just about sure. anything. But also here, um, I think they will continue uh, policy. The question is indeed, uh, will this pressure uh, the show of, uh, of support to Taiwan uh, will be, be able to show that in, in you know, many enough ways uh, for China to, to sort of also yeah, kind of. feel less confident in what they are doing. Um, because I think they are on a very clear course okay. and, and they are confident. Okay, what do you think, Kathleen? Do you see the risk of yeah, something I, happening I absolutely in, uh, if, see if the we risk. have a power yes. vacuum till yeah, I don't know, January We have seen it in, in history in, in many uh, mm -hmm. different places. When you have a power vacuum, these are the moments that things like that happen. And we cannot deny that we see an everyday more self-confident China. So in that sense, I definitely see a risk. Okay. Um, but Maybe. is it a bigger risk? Yeah. Yes, go ahead. Now been before. It's a bigger risk. The, the risk has been there all along. Yes. Uh, I think yeah. that would be my... But, but, but especially these weeks and months, this time mm -hmm. of a power vacuum, a strange mm -hmm. situation in the United States, these are moments, like, in, in moments like this in history, you see that um, things like that can easily happen. I'm not, I'm not saying that it will happen, mm -hmm. that I expect it oh. to happen, oh. but I think that we have to be aware of it. Okay. Just now, as in Hong COVID times, they expanded. Uh, yes. Now, Hong Kong and, and, and Taiwan mm -hmm. are two special cases is, is if, if the relationship to China is concerned, yes. but all countries in the region, in the immediate vicinity, have to somehow deal mm -hmm. uh, with um, China. Uh, they're all more or less dependent on trade with China, economically dependent on China, and they still want to have their own position somehow, an independent position. Uh, maybe we should start out in uh, Japan. How does Japan deal with that specific problem that they all have? Mm -hmm. um, well, in, a, in two, two ways, mm -hmm. um, very Japanese. Conditional engagement with China. Unlike the United States in Conditional in, in the engagement, region. okay? Yes. Explain. Um, yes, I was going. Sorry. Um, unlike, I think, the United States, which wants to fight back and, and you know, feel confident that it might be able to resist um, China's growing mm -hmm. role in the region, I think Japan has pretty much accepted that this is what's going to happen, so we have to manage this. We have to make sure also try and delay this, um, China's growing influence in the region. But it's not something that we can, you know, 
fight back and expect to just disappear. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a very different starting point, I think, from, from where the United States stands. Of course, the United States and Japan have a close alliance still, so they will be still cooperating. Um, but their ways of approaching uh, the China problem, as they both see it, um, is different. Understandably, of course, because for Japan, uh, China is its direct neighbor. Yes. Uh, so they can, you know, they're targeted uh, more directly, and their trade, as you say, is, is much, runs much deeper with mm -hmm. China. Um, so that's conditional engagement, um, and in, in engaging China, also trying to, um, well, to tweak some of its course, uh, which is extremely difficult. Um, but you know, it's a long-term, uh, it's a long-term battle, not a marathon, as I think um, uh, Mr. Trump was fighting it. Okay, but is, is, is the engagement, what do you, is it uh, diplomatically uh, having uh, mm -hmm. uh, cooperation in, in different fields? Is it economically? How do they, how do you? Well, Belt and Road, for example. Um, oh, that's a good one. Yes. There's, um, they are, have been trying to engage um, China on Belt and Road, and at the same time, because that was the second part of the dual strategy that the Japanese are engaged in, uh, it's resisting, so it's mm -hmm. pushing back. Um, but not, um, again, in, in the words and the language uh, as the, the, well, we've seen at the U.S. administration in the past few years, and increasingly also more from the EU, by the way, um, but more subtly trying to resist and at the same time offer resistance. Japan has been, you know, more offered than any other country in resisting China also. Um, the free and open Indo-Pacific, of course, is, is its label that it's using mm -hmm. now. Um, the Abe administration, um, in its first stint, um, many years ago, uh, more than 10 years ago, um, it proposed the Quad. You may remember yeah. the Quadrilateral Security Initiative, yes. right? Nobody wanted that. It was about United States, um, India, Australia, Australia, and Japan, yes. right? First, you know, India killed it, and basically also Australia didn't want to get on board. Uh, so it never happened. Just a few years ago, Abe relaunched this, and, and it's, of course, it was speaking to a different audience, and now people basically were, or, you know, those three countries were where Japan had been all along, yeah. um, having been, you know, Japan, China's direct neighbor mm -hmm. for, for, you know, many, <laughs> forever. Um, so then it worked. So Japan is taking the lead in resisting um, China. It's also with the EU. You know, it's not without, uh, you know, uh, the coincidence, of course, that this EU-Japan um, EPA was uh, economic partnership agreement, uh, the trade agreement, was yeah. signed basically the minute uh, Trump stepped out of multilateral trade yes. uh, agreements mm -hmm. and Xi Jinping was saying that he would be the, you know, filling the void. The Japanese stepped in and said, it's not going to happen. We will show that we will be the leader here. Yes. So yeah. they've been... Japan has grown much, you know, bigger in, in, in terms of showing itself on the mm -hmm. international stage. But as I said, it's, it's interesting to see that it's also at the same time, you know, taking conditional engagement. Yes. Uh, so with China. how did they uh, regard China uh, if it comes to the pandemic? What did Japan do? How, because being so close and being, uh, did they cooperate or did they go on the, call it the China virus? No, no, they no. wouldn't call they it the China not, virus. They <laughs> Just as they to. also did not, um, you know, uh, on, on Hong Kong, they've also not been outspoken. That's mm -hmm. not the way, that, you know, that, that would be uh, um, the Trump way. This is not the Japanese way. So they've been trying to, yeah, make the best out of a really bad situation. Um, I don't think having any doubt about uh, where China stands on this, which mm -hmm. means, you know, very little transparency. Don't trust the information that's coming from China on this. And... I have to say also, you know, less prepared than, for example, Taiwan and South Korea. Japan surprisingly took way too little action, of course, on COVID. So in that sense, they didn't take it too seriously, trying to cooperate initially also to help China, mm -hmm. and then realizing, oh, we have a problem here actually also, uh, acting on that a little too late. Okay. So may, may, that, may I ask yes, her sure. something? Because um, the United States has always been a strong ally to mm -hmm. Japan with regard to its position regarding China. Do you think that with the Biden uh, administration, this uh, strong ally um, will be back for Japan? Well, it, it will be an easier to deal with ally again. Yes, yes. Um, I think But also, so. you know, President, uh, Prime Minister Abe was, I think, the leader that's been able to develop the closest relationship with Mr. Trump more than, yeah. than any other leader, right? Remember the caps and the buddies uh, talk? Yes. Um, so they were close, even when the EU was saying, you know, you're so silly to engage with Trump mm -hmm. in this way, you know, making a fool out of yourself. He was doing this, you know, maybe... They need. 
not initially because he liked him. I think they did came to like each other, um, but for the they rest of his country. The United yeah. States, yeah, yeah. So, Obviously. Yeah, I, I, I wonder how this relation. But the multilateral, uh, you know, take that Biden administration is expected to take, that will, of course, suit Japan much better. Yes. Interesting question to me is, will Japan still be, you know, in the forefront as exactly. it has, you know, taken uh, that new role in the past few years? I think they, they might be relieved that somebody else would step in and take that role. Uh, yes, well, under President Abe, I don't think, you know, they would have probably gone side to side under mm -hmm. this new president. I, I'm not so sure. Let's see how long he stays, first of all. And <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, I have one question for the both of you. You've, you have answered already a little bit, so I'll start with Mike. Uh, if you look back five years mm -hmm. uh, up till now, how has your idea of China changed, looking at this region, looking at how China reacted in the region? My personal idea? Yes. It has not changed a bit. <laughs> but I was, I guess, the more skeptical. Uh, okay, you are already China on the... Watchers. Yes, okay. Uh, I spent uh, most of my time uh, that I lived in Asia, in Japan. Uh, and I was educated there also in a master's degree and, you know, many Japanese friends. So I was, you know, the conditional engagement of the Japanese feels very natural to me. And also the, the resistance, <laughs> the understanding that this, this is a much more subtle way to exercise power. Yes. You know, it's, you don't see it immediately, you know, like, you know, it can be, you know, students, it can be tourism that can be used in the end as a tool of mm -hmm. power play also. Um, that's the game that the Chinese are extremely good at. And that's why I think it's so fascinating to watch this country and to try and get Europeans now also to finally realize this and act on this. And when you came uh, to the West uh, here, you thought they were very naive here. Yeah, it was all about economic opportunities with China right. until a few years ago. Okay, right? and when did, did they start listening to you? What, what, was, the, what was the point um, where, where, when, because that changed? Of two course. years ago, probably. Two years yeah. only. It was very recent, okay. yes. yes. I think we are probably now where the United States was like five years ago, where we realize we have a problem, but we still think we can deal with it, you know, with the traditional tools. Yes. Uh, and perhaps we have to think of some new ways. Okay. You know, we, there's we people get, thinking that through. We yeah. get to the, to the tools we have. Uh, uh, later on. Yeah. Kathleen, for you, uh, looking back uh, when you went to Asia, when you came there 2013, yeah. now, yeah. In, in short, what was, what's the basic change? Um, well, exactly the, 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 the growing self-confidence and uh, the way China operates. Also, well, there are so many fascinating things about the way China operates, how the nation building goes on, how the narrative is used by the president. Uh, to also not only have influence in uh, China itself, but in the whole region. And like you were saying, this subtle way of growing your influence that is not seen or um, not recognized here in Western Europe, where people still think, finally, everybody will want to become like us. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm glad people listen to you. I still feel like someone uh, screaming in the desert uh, for, see what's going on there. Uh, get your act together. How will we as Europeans relate to China? What is our agenda? We will talk about that later. So, But when you ask me, well, I have seen a very self-confident country with a very impressive culture and a very uh, enigmatic but fascinating way of uh, using its power, mm -hmm. something we can still not completely understand, but we have to learn to deal with it. Okay, good. We'll deal with it later on. Thank yeah. you so far. Um, this closes the first round of this evening, and I would both of you uh, please ask to change to different chairs, and then I'll ask uh, my new guests to take your seats. And then we come back to what we can do in the West about China. Please, uh, Mahmoud and uh, Stacy, uh, take, take your seats. We'll do this, of course, for the viewers at home. We do this very, very COVID uh, proof. We are at least a meter and a half apart from each other. OK. Um, we're going to change the scenery a bit. Uh, we're going to move on in the world. Um, before I uh, introduce uh, who's uh, at the table now, I'll to say that uh, regrettably, um, René Kuperes uh, from the Klingendaal's uh, China Research Center fell ill recently and was therefore not able to make it. René, uh, please get well 
fast. Uh, if you're watching tonight or if you will be watching later on, we're uh, rooting for you. Come back. Uh, so we have asked Maike to uh, talk about Europe uh, a little bit later on. But first, we go to Africa and the Middle East. Stacy Links, welcome. Stacy is a lecturer at Leiden University and a researcher at the Leiden Asia Center, and her specialty is China African relations and the increasing power of China in Africa. Uh, Mahmoud Farou, uh, assistant professor at Leiden, specializes in geopolitics and geoeconomics, and he looks at the new Silk Road, the Belt and Road Initiative, BRI, with a special focus on the Middle East. Welcome. Uh, Stacy, thoughts on Biden? Oh, we're starting with Biden. Okay. Oh, yes. What, um, where were you Biden? and what happened? <laughs> um, where was I? I was at home, uh, working at home uh, with, my, with my little son and uh, my husband at home. Was I surprised? I wasn't surprised, I don't think. Um, reactions were positive, but a lot of question marks remain. Um, especially in my field of uh, specialization, China-Africa relations. Um, the next four years will be very interesting in terms of where China-Africa relations is placed on the U.S. foreign policy agenda. Well, where all of Africa will be. And will Africa, Africa be, will Africa be on the yeah. U.S. foreign yeah. policy agenda? Because yeah. that's, it's always a bit of a question. Exactly, exactly. I, I think in principle it will, um, but I think the U.S. has a lot of domestic issues at the moment um, that are that are more pressing mm -hmm. than foreign policy issues. So I think that will be the priority. Yes. After which, I think it will kind of pivot again to its foreign policy worldwide. Okay. Yeah. So we'll wait for that. Yeah. Where were you, and what was your first thought? Uh, <clears throat> I was also at home, uh, and. Uh, well, I was predicting because I was uh, naive enough to believe the pollsters again. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> because this time they said, okay, even if we're mistaken by 7%, we're still, still going to be fine. Biden is still going to win. So I was going into the election with a comfortable mind, again, being naive. I'm not going to believe pollsters again, ever. <laughs> uh, they said they had fixed the polls, but apparently not. So it was too close. Uh, and of course, it was stressy. <clears throat> uh, with a background, uh, with an Iranian background, uh, I was obviously thinking about the uh, American-Iranian relations yes. because yeah. the idea, or at least the prediction that we scholars of Iran uh, had was that if Trump uh, were to get re-elected, mm -hmm. there would have been war, probably there would have been war between the two countries because Iran would not have been able to suffer another four years mm -hmm. of Trump's maximum pressure strategy yes. against Iran. And possibly Americans wouldn't have been able to uh, resist the temptation to have another misadventure in the Middle East. So, so I was kind of relieved. You were relieved, uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, disaster averted. Disaster averted from uh, my perspective and uh, to speak as an academic now, so that was my personal, mm -hmm. uh, to speak as an academic, the general, the feelings in the Middle East were uh, uh, basically mixed. Iran was obviously happy. Uh, even today, the Iranian foreign minister basically warned its neighbors that in 70 days, Trump uh, will be gone, but we will be here forever, meaning you have to take us seriously again. Saudi Arabia. That was a message for Saudi Arabia. For Saudi Arabia, yes. Bahrain, uh, UAE, and others. And then uh, <clears throat> Saudi Arabia was very hesitant to congratulate Biden. Mm -hmm. And the headline was, after 24 hours of uh, the victory being announced, the headline was Saudi Arabia finally congratulates ah. Biden, which means they're not happy with the whole Obama uh, doctrine, which Biden obviously represents, or at least in the Saudi mentality. Okay, good. The Israelis have a mixed feelings uh, towards Biden because they had good relations with Trump. Uh, so that but Biden is, is very much on, on pro Pro yeah. Israel has been at least in the past. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Biden is not going to be anti Israeli, but no. uh, Israel is not going to be on the top uh, priority list of the US. Uh, like it was mentioned already, uh, mm -hmm. America has a lot of domestic issues. And when it comes to foreign policy, even uh, Israel is not going to be the number one or two mm -hmm. priority at the moment for a Biden administration, or that's what we predict. Basically. Okay, good. Um, let's move uh, to Africa. 
Yeah. Uh, maybe we first we should kind of kind of set the scene. Mm -hmm. Maybe you could explain in in a few broad uh, brushstrokes what China has been up to in Africa, uh, how deep the involvement is, what the issues yeah. are. Yeah. Okay, so uh, in a nutshell, which is, is very difficult to do, it's a, it's a tall order. Um, China has been in Africa actually for much longer than what people um, think, mm -hmm. right? Um, people think that China has only recently come into Africa. Meanwhile, the, the relationship actually dates back uh, uh, to um, the independence movements as well um, throughout Africa. And so, <clears throat> In contemporary history, at least, uh, we see that China-Africa relations have definitely increased or deepened, mm. right? Um, but it's not that they started from, um, from nothing, let's say. Now, when it comes to China and Africa, most people think of the words debt trap diplomacy. They think resource for infrastructure deals. They think neocolonialism. Um, and it's interesting because China-Africa studies has become a kind of field unto its own mm -hmm. um, within uh, academic circles. But that, that, that shows how deep and uh, multifaceted the relationship yeah. Yeah. has become. In definitely, definitely. And the interest that it has sparked, mm -hmm. right? Um, and uh, uh, a, a lot of what we as scholars in China-Africa studies, as we broadly say, focus on is, is addressing a lot of the myths and the misperceptions and misconceptions of what China is doing in Africa. Um, Africa is a huge continent. Um, China is a huge country. So when we speak of China-Africa relations, firstly, uh, you know, one of the biggest challenges we come across is the lack of disaggregation um, of, of actors. Who mm -hmm. are we speaking about? Are we speaking about government to government? Are we speaking about um, business to business? Are we speaking about investors? Um, are we speaking about Chinese aid? Are we speaking about traders? I mean, it's, you know, it, it's, it's really a, a multitude of actors that we see um, from China's side, but then also from the African side. Um, and each individual state has their own history uh, with China. Um, they all have their own <clears throat> kind of bilateral relations. Mm -hmm. We see now that, yes, uh, uh, the AU engages uh, more directly now from a continental basis, let's say, with China. And what we have is the Forum on China-Africa Cooperation, FOCAC. Um, but aside from that, generally, the relationship uh, uh, focuses on bilateral exchanges. Oh. But yes, China has invested um, billions on the continent, predominantly in uh, uh, infrastructure sectors mm -hmm. we hear of quite a lot. Um, but also in terms of uh, expanding Confucius Institutes um, throughout the, con uh, the continent, uh, also cultural educational exchanges, um, aid. Aid is actually not that big of a portion of, of Chinese engagement in Africa. But yes, investment, investment. Mm -hmm. um, and oftentimes investment in areas that have not traditionally been focused on for foreign direct okay. investment. Now, do you think it's the, the, the prime driver is economic or is there also on the part of the African side uh, the, the fact that China is not Europe, being not the old colonial? Yeah. So well, it's, it's a basically, it's, it's a new actor. So if yeah. you don't want to go to Europe uh, and you look around the world, then okay, then maybe you go to China. The menu has expanded. Right. Is, um, that, is that part of it? And then it's, it's... Yeah, well, firstly, I appreciate you asking uh, what the African drivers are and not only the Chinese drivers. Oftentimes in China-Africa conversations or debates, uh, the focus is on China and not, not Africa. Um, Africa has, has certain economic needs and developmental needs. Um, and what we need to remember is that the problems of chronic underdevelopment and poverty uh, have really been continuous for the continent. Mm -hmm. um, and traditional partners, traditional aid, even traditional um, investment flows have not brought about the change, developmentally speaking, that Africa has oftentimes envisioned. So. In that regard, what we see is that um, China's uh, engagement in Africa and vice versa 
is on a very synergi synergistic level in terms of it's driven obviously by Chinese domestic uh, considerations and factors, uh, but also uh, uh, aspirational developmental goals for the African continent. We see the African Free Trade um, uh, Community and Agreement now having been established. And, <clears throat> you know, for Africa, this, this presents an opportunity. So it's not only a pivot, let's say, away from the West per mm -hmm. se, um, it's more that, uh, that these gaps are finally being looked at, right? Okay. Um, so yeah, I'll leave it at that. Yeah, yeah, okay. Okay. We'll, I will come back to uh, the, the thorny issues of the yeah. debt trap and stuff in, in yeah. a second, because I wanted to move through the Middle East, because most people have on their radar at the, in, in Amsterdam that China is uh, very much involved in Africa. They don't know too much, I would guess, about China's plans in the Middle East. Could you give us a broad idea of what China's strategy in the Middle East is? Uh, yes, so basically uh, Middle East is uh, a region that is uh, caught between the geopolitics of the U.S. and the geoeconomics of China. So mm -hmm. geopolitically, you could easily make the argument that the U.S. reigns supreme, at least for now in terms of having military power, the uh, Bahraini uh, uh, military base, the Fifth Fleet is there. Yes. So from a hardware military perspective, uh, the, uh, the US is the uh, dominant power. Whereas in terms of investment, uh, or generally geoeconomically speaking, in terms of the very economic geography of the region reorienting itself towards an actor, it is reorienting itself towards the east. That okay. is mostly towards China, but uh, it's not only China. There's also India uh, that is playing a major role. So the Chinese initiative is called the, the BRI uh, initiative, unofficially popularly known as the New Silk Road. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's also the Indian uh, North-South uh, uh, Transit Corridor. There's also the uh, Russian-Eurasian Economic Union. There's the Japanese uh, Quality Infrastructure Initiative. Uh, uh, the word quality being a jab to the Chinese, <laughs> meaning our uh, infrastructure has quality, yours doesn't. Oh, yeah. uh, so that means the Middle East has, a lot, has, has several options. Several options, but uh, the number one uh, option, the one that resonates most, it needs to be said, is China. So China has uh, the dominant uh, uh, geoeconomic position. It's a little bit similar to Central Asia, where Russia is the main geopolitical actor, whereas China, which used to be not super present mm -hmm. in there, now is by far the number one investor and geoeconomic actor. So it's the tension between geopolitics and geoeconomics, I would say. Okay. Good. Uh, I will come back to the Middle East in a, in, in a second. Let's move to Europe. Um, you already said that uh, at the beginning. Europe, when you came here, Europe was rather naive, and when you, from a Japanese standpoint, so to speak, uh, in relationship to China, uh, things have changed. We've been talking about China for two years, virtually nonstop, uh, also here at the Bali uh, and in all of your institutes. Um, the, is the EU getting its act together? Um, yes and no. Uh, it's what is the EU first of all, right? Let's let's acknowledge it's the EU and the member states. The EU cannot be more than we allow it to be, right? I think that's where much of our talk about the EU goes wrong. Um, that's and that's very important in EU-China relations or EU-Asia relations, but especially China because China knows how to take advantage of a divided EU. Mm -hmm. Um, not because that's the first thing it always aims for, but you know because that suits its interests. Um, so if we give it the opportunity, it will do that. Yeah. Um, so we have to prevent uh, that from happening. And I think that's where the EU is not always doing so well, because again, the EU member states don't allow it. Where I do the EU see uh, going on, the EU institutions, uh, people from the European Parliament to the European Commission, everybody that I speak to is so aware of the challenge coming from China these days. They want to address it. Um, they want to offer member states the tools. Um, but of course, it has to be, go hand in hand. Um, and EU, 27 EU member states, they will not always agree, right? So no, how no, that's, you that's, that's, in all, that's in all fields. Uh, yes, but, but it, it, China is bringing that to a higher level of intensity and, and why? difficulty. 
because th we have not seen an actor so powerful that's wanting something different, really different from what the EU wants. Mm -hmm. You know, we've had our differences with the United States, but we've been allies. Um, Japan, you know, sort of was seen for a moment, you know, this blip in history, um, that to offer an alternative, you know, it never made that. It was, it's 10 times as small as Japan, you know, in terms of population. How could it ever be that threat that we thought it would be for a moment? And that's a democratic country even. Um, so China is very different um, in, in many ways, um, challenging the EU and the member mm -hmm. states. Uh, what points, what, what actions from China in Europe do you think uh, kicked off the alarm bells? What was it that made people realize, oh, oh, well, you put it very nicely. What in Europe, yes. right? It, yes, was in only, Europe, yes. it was only when China got into Europe that we started to see the challenge about China. Um, because as, as we just discussed, in, in Southeast Asia, we could have seen what was happening. It didn't you know, occur to us that that might someday also come to us here in, in Europe. So a few years ago when China, I think the biggest thing that probably everybody knows by now is what used to be 16 plus one and now is 17 plus one. Um, the 17 EU and non-EU European uh, countries cooperating with China in one forum. Mm -hmm. That is seen, was seen, you know, is still seen by many as undermining EU unity or potentially undermining. Is it, is it still alive, the initiative, by the way? It is still alive, but, but what goes unnoticed to many people is that those 17 countries uh, are not a unitary actor. You know, yes. just as China, Africa, you cannot consider mm -hmm. as one. So what we thought was really threatening is, is, is not all that threatening, but it, it rang an alarm bell. Um, the United States also helped to really ring yes. that alarm bell. The 5G uh, the Huawei debate, right? Yeah. Uh, what was in Taiwan, you know, with, you, you mentioned the umbrella movement. In Taiwan, they had at the same time or just after the sunflower movement, it was about 5G, 4G, sorry, 4G and Chinese involvement in 4G uh, that, Chinese, that Taiwanese people were mm -hmm. protesting against, you know, so many years ago. We had that just now, we're still sort of in the debate. Yes. Most EU member states have by now sort of made up their mind. The EU is trying to help them with this toolkit. Um, so that's sort of the support that the EU is giving to member states, you know, okay. well, ringing bells about what yeah. might be possible consequences of engaging so it's with. So the, it's the economic and technical power of uh, non democratic superpower on your own doorstep. That's what but, well, we're looking at. But more than that? More than that? Even um, more? Yeah, <laughs> more than that. Okay. This is the hybrid warfare agenda, right? Yes. Foreign influencing. Um, it's about interference also, not so much in political uh, elections. We've seen that in Southeast Asia mostly. Um, in, in, in Europe, no proof of that so far. Um, but meddling in our internal affairs in, in different ways, more subtle ways. Also trying to pull some of the elite, you know, to speak China's story, mm -hmm. um, get uh, mobilized Chinese students in Europe, you know, to, to speak out on China's behalf. Um, remember the, the LS, at LSE in London, there yes. was this, uh, this map out on, of the world, you know, and there was yeah. just, China was one tiny part of that, but the fact that they, um, that they didn't um, uh, allude um, Taiwan properly to China um, made for a really big fuss, and therefore a lot of debate with a Chinese perspective. So it's trying to sensitize people here in Europe to, to Chinese perspectives, trying to make us feel more naturally as if this is, you know, mm -hmm. the, the right way to go forward. Okay. And, and we really have to think through that sometimes, you know, that may be right to have an, finally an alternative on development, for example. I personally am very happy that finally now in, in, in infrastructure development, we are now also turning back to that because that's the first need of many countries. And the EU and the member states forgot about that mm -hmm. um, in our development cooperation with countries throughout the world. Um, but the EU is now turning towards what I call the digital field, um, and this is digital connectivity. I do want to mention the term because the reason why I focus on connectivity these days is because that's the EU's answer to the Belt and Road Initiative. And how many people who are watching us at home know EU connectivity? And how many of you know China's Belt and Road Initiative? Right? I think as Europeans, we need to be aware also of what's happening in the EU. Mm -hmm. And not just about no maybe, about China's well, Belt and yes, Road. I, I completely agree. Nobody knows what it is. So maybe you should define it. <laughs> the connectivity project. What's it, what's it like? 
It's a, it's a digital BRI. Well, no, no, no. Well, it, no. it's also transport. Yes. So think of BRI, but then the EU's BRI, right? Exactly. right? And we yes. don't want to label it the BRI because then it would be really copying China. Uh, we want to use a different concept, just like the Japanese are using quality infrastructure just and like, free and open in the yeah, Pacific. Just like India is, uh, is you know, pushing we need, its... We need to propagandize our own label for that. That's what the EU's also trying to do. It's not working out very well, so I'm really grateful <laughs> for this opportunity. Um, so infrastructure was the old game, if you ask me. Uh, digital is the new game, um, and that started with 5G, the debate on digital infra infrastructure and the potential for foreign interference in, in, you know, if you allow certain companies, not trusted vendors um, in this field. Um, but there's also the platform economy. How do we regulate that? Mm -hmm. What if, you know, TikTok, WeChat comes here? And by the way, I also, you know, think we, we should... Um, you know, not always agree with what American companies are doing here. So this is not just about China. It's about defining the EU's role in exactly. the world for the future. And it's a future that's going to be dominated by China much more than we know it. And that's why China is so uh, important. Okay. Exactly. I want to move back to Africa because we are still trying to find out uh, how to deal with China, um, as, as we learn. Yeah. But at the same time, we also we, the West, we never learn, are looking at Africa and saying, oh my God, there is a debt trap. There is an enormous risk for African countries yeah. to get hooked on Chinese projects and never be able to yeah. uh, be a country on their own again. Yeah. Uh, is that uh, silly, colonialism, or is that a real threat? Well, so the issue of debt uh, in Africa is one that goes beyond, obviously, China's engagement. Mm -hmm. um, and most of Africa's debt is not uh, attributed to China, in fact. So the, the, the kind of narrative of a debt trap diplomacy um, has very much been pushed by the West. And in terms of actual uh, uh, research and findings to back up that China seizes assets in this way, mm -hmm. um, is just non-existent on the African continent. We had the ports in Sri Lanka, um, but that is the only, only kind of case that we can really speak of, of asset seizure. In Africa, this is not the case, and this is not the way the, the transactions work. Um, now with COVID, what we see is African economies are struggling. Um, debt is an issue. But I think one of the important things to, to recognize when we speak about the issue of debt is that um, China does engage with the issue of debt fundamentally different to the West. Um, so even the conceptualization of debt uh, is different, right? Mm -hmm. So whereas the IMF, um, the OECD mm -hmm. countries would label a state as a, a, a highly indebted poor country, HIPC, um, and, and kind of uh, blacklist a state in its entirety in that mm -hmm. regard, um, China looks at debt from a project to project basis. So is this project financially viable, is how China uh, uh, looks at debt. Right? So it doesn't take a statewide kind of approach to debt. And that we see also in its debt relief initiative, mm -hmm. let's say. Um, so with COVID, a lot of uh, commentators were waiting for China to address the issue of debt now and, and yes. a kind of blanket relief yes. um, for, for the continent. And that didn't happen. And China said, uh, we will renegotiate, if necessary, on a bilateral basis and on a case-by-case -case basis. And that's the same thing that you see, again, in Europe, right? Where there is this narrative that it's a divide and rule kind of strategy. But China, this is the way China engages globally, mm -hmm. in Africa, too. Um, it's a very contextual approach. Um, and arguably that is, is also very necessary because these blanketed approaches, at least in the case of Africa, have not worked. They haven't spoken to the needs of each individual region or country in that way. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's also understanding uh, how China views these issues, right? And that they view it fundamentally different. And so having... Um, not having a grasp for that will result in kind of 
ill-fitted policies mm -hmm. at the end so of the day. So that means that they are, uh, they're there, they're rich, they're smarter, and they have tailor-made solutions for African yeah. countries. Yeah. Yeah. That's where they beat, yes. so to speak, yes. Uh, yes. the rest. And they also, they, they um, because nothing is set in stone, so to speak, there's a lot more flexibility in, that, in this approach. Mm -hmm. um, and arguably a lot more dynamism, right? A, a lot more back and, uh, back and forth because the fact that they do not contain themselves in any one given uh, kind of uh, this is our approach, or like we said, they, they are more tailor-made in their approach, allows them that flexibility to deal with challenges as they arise on a case-by-case -case basis. Okay, good, thanks. Yeah. Um, now I want to maybe see and put the question to you, if you're looking at the region, looking at the, what you studied, Imagine you would have to write the new China strategy for the Dutch government. Uh, you could put in one graph. What would it be, looking at the experience of uh, the region you know uh, a lot about? Uh, Kathleen, if you would have a chance, what, what would be the, the important thing? <laughs> well, one. The, one. Well, <laughs> well, the good thing is that the, government, uh, the Dutch government uh, had its China strategy uh, presented last year, but with everything that deals with China, the moment it is brought out, it is outdated already <laughs> because the developments in China are so, so quickly. I'm glad you saved my question. That, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> um, what, I, what, what I would find very important, um, basically two things. Um, I don't see why the Netherlands would not take a more um, structural lead in uh, the European field to really get between the ears of the leaders of the country that we have to develop um, a policy, a strategy, uh, how do we relate to China? Yeah, because like you were saying, it's still not there. Yeah, we, what, what is Europe? I see the urgency of at least a European agenda on how to relate mm -hmm. with this very important power. And I'm, I would even be happy if it was not only European, but other countries that are based on democratic liberal values, like Canada, like New Zealand, like Australia also, to be like part the of this. US. Uh, well, Biden, US, uh, let's see what happens, why not? So, uh, democratic liberal, um, liberal uh, values, um, that and, but to have this strategy, so the, the, the determinedness to have this strategy, and then the ability to look with other eyes at the world, mm. put away this Euro-centered uh, glasses, mm -hmm and try to see what uh, China really stands for. Things you were, all the three of you were saying, like this uh, context-based uh, approach, this uh, din dynamism, what Europe is often lacking. Try also to see it as a huge opportunity for Europe to, not, to relate to China not in a way of defense, but mm -hmm. to cooperate. Mm -hmm. There are many opportunities. If we have our act clear, what our agenda is, and then try to relate and to cooperate where possible with Engage. China. Engage. Uh, a bit like, yes, a bit like Japan. Uh, Mohamed, what, what can we learn from uh, the Middle East, from Iran, for example, that if is trying to, to yes. advise the Dutch yes. government, uh, I would advise the Dutch government to work in a European context and mm -hmm. then I would advise the European strategic policy makers to uh, work further on European initiatives but more broadly speaking as a broad comprehensive strategy what our Dutch and German colleagues and others uh, call European strategic autonomy basically mm -hmm. Europe uh, has to wake up. I think it was mentioned directly, indirectly uh, a couple of times that Europe has to wake up geopolitically uh, because Europe is practically a geoeconomic giant but a geopolitical dwarf. Mm -hmm. And it, that has to be uh, compensated for now that we are certain, I hope we are certain that we can no longer 100% count on the American security yes. umbrella and the American alliance. Yes. Uh, so uh, the idea of European strategic autonomy would be uh, 
uh, a must, uh, I would say. And in that context, when it comes to the Middle East, I think the relationship between Europe and Middle East for various historical reasons uh, is very complicated, but I think one solution, if I were to advise the Dutch and European officials with one word, that would be investment with China and also in competition with China, with Japan in the region, with regional players that have a lot of money, such as UAE, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, mm -hmm. in the region, uh, basically to have a voice. Because if you don't invest in the region, you're not going to have a voice in regional affairs. Now, in the case of Syria, people are listening to China. Iran is involved in Syria. Saudi Arabia is involved in Syria directly, indirectly. But both have to listen. They hate each other, but both listen to China because China has invested in the region and uh, the countries have to listen to China. Israel, that doesn't find many countries in the region palatable, has to listen to China because, <clears throat> uh, again, uh, Chinese investment in the region gives it a voice. Uh, Japan has a voice, not as uh, big as the Chinese mm -hmm. voice, but a voice nonetheless. Russia has a strong voice, but also for military reasons. Uh, but Europeans, uh, not much of a voice. America is losing its voice uh, uh, slowly but steadily. Okay. So uh, investment and co-investment with other mm -hmm. countries in the region and also with external, okay. also with China. Why not? Yes. Yeah. Don't, don't, don't leave the, the Middle East. To others is, is yeah. basically your advice. Yeah, because Middle East uh, has so many implications for Europe. Uh, we have uh, the refugee issue, we have mm -hmm. radicalism, yeah. sure. uh, so many ethnic sense, relations yeah. between minorities in Europe uh, and in the Middle East. So, yes, there are too many reasons not to forget uh, the Middle East as a European policymaker or Dutch. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. What can we learn from Africa? What would you write um, into the so strategy? Yeah, I was thinking, and uh, you know, we, we often ask the question, how does the world cope with China? How does the world deal with China? And uh, what you mentioned earlier, the word relate, I think is so important and so crucial here. Um, cope, deal, you know, these terms reflect a, a, a China threat narrative. And yeah. in some regards, yes, China is competition, but I think starting from a place of relationships and how one can relate is a, is a far more constructive way to, to go about. Um, if I was to have a paragraph, <laughs> that it would be a very long paragraph. <laughs> okay. um, <clears throat> but no, I, I would focus on this idea that, uh, you know, difference in international relations is something that should be welcomed. Um, mm -hmm. You can have your values, you can have your way of doing things, but at the end of the day, uh, diversity and difference um, is very important to the African continent. Um, these are things that we also pride ourselves on, is, is having uh, uh, the ability to, to have our differences um, and still engage and still relate. Um, I think in that regard, uh, Europe or the Netherlands' um, paternalistic, often paternalistic tone is something that I would leave for the history books um, and definitely uh, come to the table with a far more constructive and cooperative um, attitude. Okay, yeah. good. Uh, go your own way. If uh, I was, I'm looking at, at, uh, at Europe again, uh, under the Trump uh, administration, uh, Europe was basically asked to uh, fall in line with the US against China. Oh, there was a lot, of, a lot of talk about a new Cold War and there was no other solution. So we'll have to, it's a confrontational course that's the only way to go. Um, do you think that Europe, there is room for a European third way between the two major blocks? And what would it, how, would, how would we do that, Mike? A third way, yes, but a, a full-blown third party in this standoff that we see uh, emerging now, I, I don't see Europe mm -hmm. being able to develop into that. But a third approach, if we can mobilize other like-minded players, I think that is our best bet. Um, it also has to go with like-minded partners in Southeast Asia, um, in East Asia, mm -hmm. in other parts of the world. It has to go in multilateral institutions. Um, so that's, I think, where, where the EU can make a difference in trumping, again, multilateralism. Um, 
so that we can make sure that we are not going to be that playground. You know, Southeast Asia is play, ground zero, right, if you will, for, for what's, uh, how China can or cannot, will, late, will be less able to expand its, uh, its influence. Um, we were sort of developing into that second key playground. I think we're kind of resisting that now just in time. Uh, so we can have started to become a referee, right, in standard setting mm -hmm. uh, regulation. Um, but we have to become a full-blown player ourselves. Yes. And that is, I think, what we should really invest in. It was in the China strategy, by the way, um, where, you know, which was calling for you know, the Netherlands going with the EU, via the EU, in its relations with China. Um, but I very much agree with you know, other speakers that this should not be a China strategy. It should be an EU future-proof uh, policy for you know, how we operate in this world, uh, where China is going to be so much more influential. Um, mm -hmm. So we have to know how to act with that and, and play judo, right? Engage, you know, on, on China's play judo. strengths okay. and then, uh, <laughs> yeah, then make them into our own strengths, basically. Make them into our own strengths. Yes. Okay, that's and it. I think the, the digital field is going to be key in that. Okay. High tech and geopolitics is the agenda for the future. The, the trade tech standoff, you know, that the, the U.S. and China have been engaged in in the past few mm -hmm. years is here to stay. So okay. let's focus there, um, yes. you know, our efforts. If you want to be uh, less naive uh, as an uh, uh, economic actor, uh, one of the things that you can do is, is invite the government back into the economic field to have uh, uh, industrial policies, uh, strategies. Uh, you. Uh, uh, check which investments come in, who's behind that, this is state enterprises, except for that. Is that the way you would propose we should go? Yeah. So about a, a bit the French way in, in Dutch? No, no, not the French, not the French way. There's <laughs> many different ways of industrial policy. And, which one would and you? I think the, the French is one extreme. Let's okay. not go there. Um, but let's do at least more than what we've done in recent years, because that was too naive. Um, and that's really where we're having to explore gray zones, right? Mm -hmm. We were in the white zone. We are basically went to black. And there's so many shades of gray in, you know, in, in ch what the China brings to the world. We have to learn to deal with that. And I think actually we can learn a lot also from countries in Asia, because they were the first to deal with them. Um, you know, even in Southeast Asia, they haven't always been able to resist or to fight back in the way Japan has been better able mm -hmm. to, but there's so much to learn from them. That's a okay. There was one issue that uh, I thought fascinating about Iran. Iran uses the BRI and uses the Indian counterpart as well. Yeah. Uh, uh, and more. Yeah. Uh, sorry? And more. And more. Yeah. But the, the, there, was, there, was, there was one uh, instance where they uh, take uh, like the, the shipping lane, the, the products are shipped to uh, a harbor in, from India to uh, Iran, and the Indian program refurbishes the harbor, and then the same goods are put on the train, and then the train line is paid for by the BRI. Is yeah. that... that, that yeah. And that works. You could, you could combine these things yeah, that without works. getting in trouble with either one of the big players. Yeah, that works. And the same trains basically operate for the uh, Russian Eurasian Economic mm -hmm. Union and also the Ashgabat Agreement, which is an agreement between India, Iran, and Central Asian landlocked mm -hmm. Central Asian countries to have access to uh, the Gulf and the international waters. So it works for at least four initiatives. Mm -hmm. uh, also, obviously, for India, the north-south uh, transit corridor. So there's a lot going on, and this is one of the issues that I think people have to wake up to, because if you look at the Middle East, uh, or as they call it in the Middle East, or in Asia, West Asia, so mm -hmm. even the name is different in, mm -hmm. in there. Uh, if you look at this region, uh, from a Western media perspective, even a lot of academic perspective, it's mostly about geopolitics. It's mm -hmm. mostly about lack of human rights, lack mm -hmm. of uh, democracy. Uh, it's about terrorism. It's about uh, dictators and authoritarianism. Big but issues. In, yeah, big, big issues, but not the whole picture. So mm -hmm. it's geopolitics. Yes. It's 50% of the picture. The other 50% mm -hmm. is economics, and that doesn't really get covered in the media, mm -hmm. and I would say much of the academia. OK, and that's, I a, would, that's a good point. Yeah. Okay. I would also just interject that the same applies um, for the African continent, right? Uh, what we see is a focus, even when it comes to, to human rights, right, of um, this assumption that there is no human rights dimension to China-Africa relations, that the relationship is necessarily inimical to human rights. 
um, what we often forget is that Africa, long before you know this increased cooperation, has been vying for the right to development, mm -hmm. which is a fundamental, inalienable human right. Um, and so we have this idea that China is constantly pushing these agendas, and it's China's influence that is now affecting, you know, change within international norms, et cetera, et cetera. But these are issues that have been on the table for decades by um, African uh, communities. Uh, this isn't always just a question of corrupt elite leaders colluding with Chinese, you know, Chinese leaders and Xi Jinping. These are also everyday people issues. Um, and so the development side of the coin is, is, needs to be recognized as a fundamental issue um, that drives cooperation from both sides. Okay. Yeah. Um, I have to look at the audience at home. We did not forget you. At least I did not. So we'll get to the questions you've been sending in. Um, the first one is for Dr. Lynx. <laughs> what are some of the key differences among African countries in their relationship to China? Okay. I, 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 I say take two. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, key differences. So I would say that, let's see. Um, what we see happening in terms of key differences, again, it, it's a context-based approach, right? So oftentimes what we see, for example, in Zambia, um, what we see is that it also depends on the internal political uh, situation and how, for example, uh, uh, China is politicized domestically. Mm -hmm. um, so you have candidates, political parties who will either uh, feed into a China threat narrative or a very pro-China narrative. Um, so it really depends on what country you're speaking about, what the political climate is like. Um, and then I would say another factor is are, are the historical ties, right? China does have historical relations or more uh, um, uh, deepened relations with certain African countries over others. That being said... So what, what are the traditional countries China has linked um, with? So, for example, in South Africa. Yes. That's, that's where I'm from, so <laughs> I, can, I can speak to that. Um, but also Ethiopia, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so we see that, but in general, as much as... You know, on the one hand, China has a very contextual approach. On the other hand, um, Africa's needs... The, the kind of investment that you get um, is investment that is needed across the continent. So in that regard, you also, you do have a lot of similarities, obviously, when it comes to infrastructure development, for example. Um, so, so it also depends on the resources of, of said country. But this, this idea that, for example, uh, China has better relations in resource-rich countries um, or does more in mm -hmm. resource-rich countries um, is not the case. And we see that China is invested across Africa, um, whether or not its return in investment is as high in country A as country B. It's not just only about precious metals. No. No, no that's quite clear. Absolutely Good. Not. Another question is, um, now many Hong Kongers moved to Taiwan, as we mentioned earlier. Uh, does this make the island even more important for China as well as Taiwan's allies, both economically and strategically? Kathleen, I'll go to you, um, I think. Well, of course, China is looking very closely at everything that is happening uh, in Taiwan. And um, China is also looking closely at where all these pro-democrat uh, leaders now are moving to. Um, but to say that in a general sense this makes China, makes Taiwan um, um, a, a, a place to watch more closely in terms of a threat to China or that it would be more important for China to uh, um, make sure that Taiwan becomes again part of, uh, of the mainland. Um, I'm not sure whether that is the way China looks at what's happening in the region. Uh, you know, they, they feel themselves as the natural center 
of a hierarchical arrangement of smaller countries. Mm -hmm. And um, of course they watch what's happening. And when it's necessary, they will say or make a move and make clear what their position is. But uh, I think that's it. That's it. Okay, good. Um, will the West's emphasis on human rights, Mike, I think that's uh, maybe for you, versus vis-a-vis -vis China's emphasis on economic relations result ultimately in the demise of the West on the international stage? Well, I have, are we hang up, hung up on human rights? And well, I've seen in, in recent years that uh, European countries have also started to deal differently with human rights. Um, so the way that we've been appealing human rights before, mm -hmm. um, human rights in, in sort of absolutist terms, um, we're shifting away from that, um, basically from my perspective, based on the realization that it doesn't really work well. It's, it, it, you know, it feels very nice for your own parliament because you know, then probably you can say that you've made a certain cause in a certain context. Um, which your parliamentarians are likely you know, to, to applaud. But then the real question is, I think, did it make a difference in the way a country is behaving? And, and you know, as, we're trying, as we're finding out now that it, we have not seen so much of a response, I think our approach to human rights is, is shifting. Uh, we see now, for example, that yes, we're speaking out on, on Uyghurs. Yes, we're mm -hmm. speaking out on uh, you know, China's outreach to diaspora. Um, but the, where we can actually make that difference then is to you know, help the diaspora here that are confronted with you know, that pressure from China. Um, that's where I think, you know, so it's a different way of approaching human mm -hmm. rights and what we find problematic about you know, how other countries deal with human rights. Sometimes it's perceived as, oh, you're giving up on that agenda. Um, I personally don't agree with that. I, I, I would more, as I said, you know, f think that as a way of reframing human rights. And of course, we still need the people, you know, to, to, to speak out and, and ask, you know, and be vocal in where yes. we can on, on what is problematic. But whether or not a government can really act on that in bilateral relationship in public and expecting that to be, you know, Effective. to make a difference, mm -hmm. um, that is, I think, uh, it was know, like, uh, not the case. It just reminds me of, of the European leaders talk to Xi Jinping, uh, I think, a month ago, and and, and, and they came out and said, okay, we definitely uh, talked about uh, human rights and mm -hmm. the Uyghur question. And then 10 minutes later, China gave out a press release stating that she had said, okay, uh, oh. we don't uh, accept your uh, interference. Oh. But can I give yeah, one example of where, how I also think then that we are changing? Yes. Digital human rights. Sorry, I'm taking it again to the yeah. digital field. Export controls on, hu on, on, on um, you know, surveillance technologies, mm -hmm. for example. Right? The ways that Chinese companies or Chinese government, local governments or national governments are using surveillance cameras are not you know, in line with what um, you know, the makers of those products intended them originally. Right? This, if it's helping the, the, the social surveillance of people in, in a very extreme way, where they're giving points for not doing something or for mm -hmm. doing something. Um, and based on, on, you know, if you get too many points, you cannot get a visa to go abroad or you cannot uh, get a mortgage or whatever. That's really impacting, you know, basic human rights. Um, and that is a way where we can make a difference if we, if we decide on the grounds of digital human rights not to export certain technologies then, for example, to China. And that is happening. Um, the Netherlands is a front runner in this field. Mm -hmm. And this is where we, you know, where we felt that, or the government felt that it can make a difference, where it ha does have real effect and where it is acting. So I, I really would hope that people are also noticing that. Okay. I think that we should advertise that a little bit more then, if that's, uh, if that's the case. Um, how has COVID affected the development of the Belt and Road in Central Asia and in Africa? Uh, Belt and Road, Central Asia, is, was there a uh, Well, uh, COVID, according slowdown? the COVID-19, according to the Chinese officials, I'm using uh, their own uh, vocabulary now, uh, has severely impacted, quote unquote, 20% of all the projects, globally speaking, and uh, badly affected, quote unquote, mm -hmm. uh, another 50% of all the projects. So again, in order to see which country, which project, you have to really take it case by case. Yes. And it really depends on the wave of infections. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so yeah, there, 
but in the bigger context of the pandemic, we can talk more definitively about the situation, the economic situation of China. Uh, according to the IMF predictions, China has rebounded. It's going to have a, an economic growth of about 1.9 percent this mm -hmm. year. Uh, not uh, so for most of the Western economies, uh, which are going to remain stagnant, at least for the foreseeable future, meaning this year and next year. Uh, so in that sense, uh, China has turned this crisis into an opportunity in these regions. Uh, when you talk to or listen to officials uh, on uh, the Middle Eastern media, Central Asian media, uh, you can uh, see that there's a sense of admiration for how quickly China mm -hmm. managed to uh, basically turn around, yeah. turn around uh, the situation. Also, there's the face mask diplomacy, the vaccine diplomacy. Uh, a lot of uh, people are looking for the Chinese vaccine and so forth. So, yeah, uh, it's a mixed uh, type of situation yeah. for China, but uh, there are positives coming out. There are positives that. coming out, yeah. but they also had a slowdown in the BRI uh, yeah. development. Yeah, there's also the that slowdown. The, yeah. That's the question. Okay, a question for Stacey. Uh, what's the relationship between South Africa and China? Your own country, South Africa. What's the relationship? Yes, what's the relationship <laughs> between South Africa and China? And how does it differ from other African countries? Um, so South Africa maybe has, is in a, is in a, a bit of a different position insofar as, firstly, its position uh, continental, on, on the continent, on the continent. Um, in terms of how it's related to traditional powers in the past mm -hmm. and where it's placed itself um, in terms of traditional powers vis-a-vis -vis China. Um, I think South Africa is cautious at the moment. Um, however, it, it is leaning slightly uh, towards China. Um, we see that now, most recently, with uh, um, the, the latest uh, uh, economic uh, kind of state of the nation address, um, that South Africa does want to turn to this kind of infrastructure development uh, uh, plan, especially considering its economic situation. It's in a very dire economic situation. Um, and though China isn't mentioned by name as such, uh, we can assume that, that this means, you know, a bit more of a pivot, um, an explicit pivot uh, towards the East. Um, but South Africa's foreign policy in general is, is one that is complicated because of this in-between position. Um, and on the African continent, on the one hand, it's seen as often turning its back against mm -hmm. its African kind of identity. And on the other hand, it's seen as, as uh, uh, positioning itself as, as a kind of hegemon uh, on the continent. Um, and so it's, it's very difficult to, to say precisely what its position is on China. Um, I think there's a lot of soul searching going on uh, in South Africa in terms of what position we take on the continent and then globally speaking too, because we, you know, our economic si situation is so dire that we kind of first need to focus on that before we assume this position of any kind of leadership, I would say, on, on the continent. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, there was a question about... Uh, uh, we, I think that's uh, how uh, does um, China influence, as an example, other um, authoritarian states? Can we? Can you? Um, if, if we, we all feel that uh, you can yeah. see the example there, so it's it's easier if yeah. uh, if it's not there. But can we uh, make it very practical? Can you have? Do we have examples of where you see this? Um, well. Um I have to say that uh, very often at different, in different contexts here in the Netherlands and broader in Europe, I hear to my um, astonishment people say, you know, such an authoritarian system like China has, has many advantages. Look what we have. We, we cannot take decisions. Everything takes so long here in democracies. Look what's happening there. Uh, for instance, when you take the environment, 
um, the moment China takes a decision, for instance, to tackle air pollution, mm -hmm. it just gives a mandate in uh, three months all buses should be electric buses, for instance. And you have a difference. And people say, yeah, look what's happening here. We have to have debates in Parliament. So, um, like you were saying, that subtle influence um, in key places in science, in economic elites, in political elites, where the propaganda for a system like the authoritarian system is subtly made, has its effect in the minds of many people who say, well, democracy uh, is nice, but it has many um, negative effects also. And that is why I say that um, we have to be aware because the values that go with democracy, the moment we start doubting and that we start thinking, well, there are interesting alternatives to democracy, the values that democracy stands for are really something that we should be uh, ready to stand up for. I'm saying rightly that we should not see China as an offense, that we should defend ourselves. We should relate. We should see how to connect. Uh, we should cherish the differences, mm -hmm. but when you really want to do that, you have to know what you stand for and what is precious to you. And I would say that democratic values should be something that at least European countries, but also other like-minded countries, should really be aware of the value they have for us. And that it is something that in relation with other countries, and certainly with authoritarian countries like China, big powers we have to learn to relate with, be aware of the value, and be prepared and have a strategy how in relation with a country like China, you can cherish these values. Okay. I think... Uh, oh, sorry. Okay, quick, one quick <laughs> round. Stacey, one reaction. Just, just a remark on that. Um, you know, <clears throat> I think the challenge then also for Europe in a uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, putting forth those those values uh, on the continents uh, like Africa or on a continent like Africa is that you know we have a lot of democracies um, and what people have seen in South Africa you know speaking about my my country of origin um, democratic values and uh, democracy has its place, but it hasn't given people the food on the table, right? It hasn't Absolutely. provided um, the other side of the coin. Yeah. Uh, so in terms of how Europe goes about promoting that or how Europe mm -hmm. uh, uh, goes about doing that, I think is going to be key in either its success or exactly. um, its uh, uh, Lack of success. I wouldn't say failure, but lack, lack of, success. of success. Okay, Mike, you also wanted to say something about democratic values. I saw. Yes. I mean, what is it that we're talking about, right? It's to me, it's transparency, it's rule of law, it's people's mm -hmm. first, and that's that's what I think we should emphasize because China is also propagating itself as you know democratic. At least that's what I hear from people in Southeast Asia. We are like influence, you know, we're the, the sub the object mm -hmm. of China's um, political influencing there, and so it's a subtle tweak to, you know, yeah, you go with democracy, but you don't want the U.S. style democracy. That's clearly not working. You know, you want our style of democracy. So, you know, in order to bring this debate forward, we have to really, you know, emphasize Define how we are different. Exactly. exactly. Yes. Yes, okay. What is this about? And and I think that's where the EU, the EU indeed has to emphasize its third approach that you were uh, calling to, which puts citizens first, not the state, um, not big tech or, mm -hmm. you know, companies, uh, which is, you know, more the case in the United States, but it's people's first. And that is appealing to many people in, in also in Asian countries. Um, and of course, then the big question is, do we have you know, the money basically and the institutions that, that it takes to actually you know, spread that message and to make people aware of how this works? Because that requires- And the requires, mindsets. Uh, and yeah. the mindsets. That's what Kathleen said. Of course. Yeah. I think, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm afraid we came to the end of this evening uh, with the notion that uh, we should not let uh, China define what we think is democracy. Uh, for all the people that, whose questions have not been answered, I'm very sorry. We'll uh, get to them the next time, if there is a next time. There is a, definitely going to be a next China debate, because there is a lot much to talk about. Thank you very much, 
my guests at the table. Thank you very much for uh, viewing us and sending us your questions. Um, that's where we close the evening. Before we sign off, I would like to give the floor to Lili Spangers, the manager of the Leiden Asia Centers, for a few closing remarks. Lili? Thank you very much, Michelle. And I would like to thank you and the speakers of tonight for your very inspiring contribution uh, at this closing event of the series, The Many Phases of Modern China. We started out in June with the economics, then we moved to domestic politics and human rights in September, and now tonight we have dealt with China's international position and the relation with the rest of the world. Uh, for those of you who are still watching, you never know when things are online, thank you for joining us, and we admire your stamina. For those of you who missed out on the two earlier sessions, they are still available at the website of the Bali and the Leiden Asia Center. Uh, now, the um, cooperation with uh, the Bali has, for us, the Leiden Asia Center been very pleasant, so we decided to continue it in next year. We believe that China will remain pivotal to many crucial developments around the globe. The topics have not been decided yet, let alone the dates, but we will certainly try to focus on very special aspects of China, and I would imagine that it would be possible to have one session on the unfriendly takeover by Jack May from Mar a Lago. You never know what kind of surprises the future holds in stock for you. Good. Um, let me um, uh, uh, finish by thanking Sara Toxus from the Bali and my colleague Jonas Lammerting for all the work that they have done to make this possible. And all three of us are very much hoping that we will be able to see many of you next year in person, live here in the Bali. In the meantime, thank you for joining us and stay safe. We're here. Thank you all very much. We can't, we can't shake hands, so we'll, we'll do it.